Dear loving Father, which are in heaven, dear Lord, we present ourselves this morning, Lord, that we may learn of thee, and Lord, that we may better understand the process by which we can enable others, Lord, to regain their health, and even ourselves, dear Lord, can benefit from this process. Be with us now, Lord, as we seek a clear understanding how to reverse and answer the calls to many of the ills that afflict us. Christ's name, amen. Amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at the human x-ray. Years ago, before they had the x-ray machine and all the PET scans and so on, <clears throat> the doctors had to be trained to be a human x-ray. They had to be able to recognize conditions by looking at the body. They had to study the body so well that they could tell when something is wrong. Uh, and that technique has gone way out of style uh, because now you can depend on technology to do it. Uh, but I really like that old system of recognition of disease. Uh, I remember I did a camp meeting up in upstate New York. It's been many years ago. Me and Thomas Jackson was up there doing a camp meeting. And when I was one of the last people to speak, so I went around with my notepad and I was looking at different people writing down what I saw. And I looked at everything. I listened at how they walk. I listened to noise come from their body, everything. The skin texture, the hair texture, the nose, the eyes. I watched everything. And I made notes. And so when I got ready to speak, I asked about 10 people to stand up and I told them what was wrong with them. And, and they said I was a witch. <laughs> So I explained to them that, no, it was just that I had studied the body so well I could pick it up. I mean, you know, I was close on most of it, but sometimes I get off on it. But you're close enough that you can really pick it up. So this is uh, kind of let you know how we study the body to be able to recognize problems that may occur. And once again, disease is a curing process. Disease never comes without a cause. So everything has a cause. So don't think that it's just happened to you. That's a cause and a purpose. The way is prepared by indiscretion, a disregard to the laws of health. And so this is not something that just come up all of a sudden. You prepare that. And when that happened, disease is invited by disregards to the laws of health. Many suffer in consequence of the transgression of their parents. While they are not responsible for what their parents have done, it is nevertheless their duty to ascertain what are and what are not the violation of the laws of health. So God is expecting us to go back and investigate what are the laws of health and what God requires out of us. And once we do that, we should avoid the wrong habits of their parents by correct living. And this is why you cannot follow cultivated or uh, ethnic or uh, racial relationships to achieve the best end of good health and a very spiritual and vibrant life. You can't do it because your parents and your ancestors may have been going down the wrong pathway. But you grow up with that, and you feel it's the best for you because you have cultivated what they have done, and you like it. But sacrifice is about denying what you like. And that's what makes it a sacrifice, and cultivating a habit that is foreign to you. And that would be the battle that we would have to face what your body is saying about your health, and your body talks to you. But we have become so desensitized that we cannot notice. We think we can see, we think we can listen, we think we can feel, but in actuality, we do not. Uh, we only use a small percentage of our mental power in the first place. 
If we could use 25% of our mental power, we'd be a genius. We only use a fraction. And most of that which we use is cultivated, you know, repetitiously habits. Uh, but we never really call on the mental forces to understand, to process, to break down, to analyze. We simply just do it out of habit. You know, I've done this this way. I watch my parents do it this way. And you do it. But you never stop to try to process that. And so, and you never expand on that. You simply stay in that rut because you've always done it like that. That is not a good process. Now, one of my classes that I teach is one of the first classes I take the students. I'm here 25, 30 students, and we'll go outside. And they think I'm taking them on earth walk but I'm not taking them on the herb wall. But they're ready with their pads to write notes, and wait, ready for me to tell them what red clover, or yellow dock, or whatever, their chaparral. <clears throat> so I just go to my favorite little place, and I sit, and I don't say nothing. And they just anxiously waiting, when is this man going to talk about these herbs? I don't say anything. About an hour later, I said, let's go back to the classroom. And I said, now write me an essay on what you learned today. He said, what we learn? We didn't learn nothing. You didn't teach us nothing. <laughs> I was trying to get them to see that they are not using their mental powers. There was a lot happening around them, but they weren't noticing that. They were so spoon-fed that they was waiting to be fed. And they missed out on everything around them. And so... Um, so you have to learn how to see. Most people see with their eyes, and that's the wrong thing to do. Because if something happened to your eyes, you would be blind, mentally blind. Because a blind person is not blind at all. Blind people can see because they see with their brain, their mind. They don't depend on their eyes for seeing. That's why they can walk through a dark house and don't follow with nothing. We, we what, fill in and making sure we don't trip over something. They don't even worry about that. And so um, they can sense the vibration from the wall when they get close to it. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. We can't do it because we're dependent on eyesight. They can count money better than we can. They can get around and travel. And uh, same with learning to listen, to hear. We're so busy listen to all the noise around us, depending on our ears to hear, and we miss the very things that have been said. And to feel, we have to learn how to feel. But we're so desensitized that we can't feel. We cannot feel another person's pain, or another person's desires or love, because we're so encapsulated by our own sensitivity that we can't expand it to other people. And it limits us, really does. So uh, if you really want to be really good at it, you've got to learn to listen, to feel, and to see. And stop depending on these mechanical things to do it. You know, and then you'll find that no matter whatever happened to you, you'll be able to function. So your body talks to you in a language that is plain. The average physician thought of no other form of treatment, and the public has grown so used to the idea that health could be bought in a bottle. Now, we all think that, not just allopathic medicine, but natural medicine, herbal medicine. <clears throat> all, all of us, we feel that if we want to cure arthritis, we need to go to the health food store, or we need to get some kind of herbal concoction. <clears throat> Okay, we won't need it to this evening. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, people that depend on natural medicine, they depend on that as if the cure is in the capsules and the pills and the herbs. And the people that <clears throat> depend on allopathic medicine, 
think that it's in the different type of drug concoctions. And uh, <clears throat> it do not exist. There is no medicine, there is no herb, there is no vitamin that can cure a disease. It is the Lord thou God that healeth thee. And so thou faith hath made thee whole. The only reason God has sanctioned the use of natural remedies is to instill faith in us. And so we need these helping aids to help us have faith. But once faith, faith has come, we no longer need it. And so uh, if we had great faith, we would not need to make up cheese. We, need, we would need to do none of that stuff. But because we lack faith, we need some kind of helping aids to help us uh, until we can reach that point. That it never occurred to them that any other form of treatment was possible. Symptoms of the so-called disease was treated as disease itself. <clears throat> so now what is the symptom of the disease? It's, okay, it could be pain. It could be nausea. It could be vomiting. It could be diarrhea. <clears throat> it could be a fever. These are symptoms. They are not diseases. <clears throat> it could be cancer. Uh, it could be Lou Gehrig's disease. It could be MS. These are symptoms. They are not diseases. If we can ever reverse that, that habitual thought that disease is a bad thing, disease is not bad, disease is a good thing, <clears throat> it's kind of like the law of God. Why was the law of God given, written on stones? as our schoolmaster to educate us what's in us that we're sinful. We had lost sight of that. I was alive until the law came, but when the law came, I revived and I died. Do we understand that? I was alive before the law was revealed in my mind because I thought I was all right. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, everything's okay with me. I thought you ain't, ain't a bad deal. You know, I enjoyed that. You know, lying, hey, lying is just part of me. You know what I mean? I don't feel like that brought death unto me. I didn't. I feel like, hey, everybody lies. You know, so what? And so, but when the law came, then I found out that I was dead because the law condemned me as a liar. And I didn't know that. Then I revived and I died. So, it revealed who I was. Disease followed the same pattern. I thought I was in pretty good health. But when the symptoms came, I found out I had arthritis. Well, you had arthritis before the symptoms came. The symptoms is nothing but a transcript to let you know you had arthritis before you had the pain so that you can start making preparation to do something about it. Because if the pain never came, you would never know you had it. It is the mercy of God that you have pain, that you feel the symptoms, because the symptoms is the most loving, patient voice from God reminding you that you're sick. God won't do nothing unless he reveals it to his servant. So we should rejoice in the pain. We should rejoice in the symptoms. We should rejoice to know that we have cancer. Instead of stressing us out, we should what? Praise God that you revealed in me what was happening in me that I had no knowledge. If God let that cancer destroy you without you knowing it, then he wouldn't be a compassionate, sensitive God. So it's his love that's doing that. He sent a message to his servants to warn them. But we don't see it like that. And so instead of being a good news, it become bad news. If it was good news, we could say, well, praise God, now I can do something about it. That's somebody with great faith. But if you don't have faith, you're going to panic. Say, I'm dying. That's it. I'm not going to make it. And you start trying everything under the sun. Yes. Most of the people, when they have cancer, 
You want only to be healed, but not to change the lifestyle. Right, that, that's it. And the medical system has become uh, very wealthy because people are not concerned about being well. They just want to feel good. And for some reason, people think you have to go to college eight, ten years to get people to feel good. Some of the best physicians are drug addicts and alcoholics. They have figured out how to make you feel good, and they don't have no education. And that's based on what allopathic medicine do. It makes you feel good. And you're not concerned about getting well as long as, hey, I, I don't have pain free. Go down to the next crack house or the dope house. They'll make you feel good. <laughs> don't mean they have that medical knowledge. So feeling good is not a criteria that you're in good health. It means you have covered it up. Okay, symptoms of the so-called disease was treated as disease itself. So if the symptoms are treated as disease, then we're going to try to get rid of it, cast it out, burn it out, destroy it. When you do that, you're destroying the symptoms, and the symptoms is a voice trying to make you aware of something. So you're trying to silence the word of God. And you do that in your spiritual life, too. That's why it resonates over in your physical life, because if somebody comes to you and says, well, you know, you know, you, know you, you, you should keep the Sabbath day holy, but I don't want to hear that. Please don't bring that Sabbath stuff to me. You're trying to silence the word of God because it's a reproof to what you want to do. And so you're doing the same thing in the physical world when you get the symptoms and say, you know, you want to silence that by taking some medication that will simply cover it up. The main object of the treatment was to smother and reduce the symptoms. That's all you're concerned about. I insist that practically all disease were in reality a process of curative effort on the part of nature to right or wrong. All right, so that's, that's a beautiful concept if we can believe it. Maybe you can understand it better if I give you this illustration. Anyone who understands the mechanism of a sneeze should understand the nature of such disease. Now, what is the mechanism of a sneeze? You, you cannot stop it. You're trying to suppress it because you don't want people to recoil from you. And you feel it coming and you're doing everything to stop it. And boy, all of a sudden, it's out there. You can't stop it. And then the minute you sneeze or cough, they said, boy, you coming down with a bad cold. <laughs> Let me check and see if you got a fever. You catching a cold. But when you look at the practicality of it, are they really catching something? For the foreign matter is, is violently expelled in the process of sneezing. So is waste and morbid matter expelled by the body and a set of symptoms noted by us in the many so-called diseases. So how can you catch a cold and you're casting it out at the same time? Because when you sneeze and cough, you what? Casting it out. You're not catching it. Now somebody can catch it, but you can't catch it. You are finished with the cold when you start coughing and sneezing. The cold is finished. It's leaving your body. Now, when you were feeling all right and, you know, hey, I ain't got no cold, I'm, I can handle this. He said, I don't have it. I'm, I'm, I'm in good shape. That's when you got a cold. You catch a cold in the summertime, you get rid of a cold in the wintertime. Do that sound practical? It does. It makes sense to me, but it might not make sense to you. And the reason for that is you catch sickness when you feel good. You get rid of sickness when you feel bad. And this is such a wonderful, beautiful news because to sick people that are so sick, you can look at them and say, you're getting well, keep fighting. They say, no, I'm dying. No, you're getting well. And if they could understand that concept, by beholding, they would become changed. But most of the time, they will what? Simply uh, succumb to... They, they would simply come to um, to their emotions. 
I'm scared of your electricity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> uh, most of the time they will fall victims to their emotions and they will give in to it. So, uh, uh, but if you would encourage them to see that in reality you're getting better. Your vital forces are weak, but you're getting better. And explain to them that concept that when they have these so-called symptoms, it is a curative reaction, not a disease process. Then you must educate them, what is the disease? <clears throat> it is your wrong habits. And you enjoy doing those wrong habits. When you ate that cake, when you ate that ice cream and that chicken, you enjoyed that. That's your disease. Okay? And now, because of your violation, the symptoms come along and say, hey, something is happening inside of your body. You don't, you're not aware of it. I'm about to let you know what's going on. And you end up with that pain in your knee and your back and your head and that's what it is. Every acute disease is merely a healing crisis. A result of the body struggling to free itself from the load of toxic poison within. Every pimple, that's a little bump on your nose, our ball is evidence of the body throwing off these poisons, poisons through the skin. So when you get a bump on your nose, you look in the mirror and say, oh, man, I don't want to go to work with a bump on my lip, on my nose. It don't look good. Do you know what I mean? And it, to you, it just has cosmetic implications. It don't look good. But in reality, your body is trying to let you know there's toxic matter in the system and it's throwing it off through the mucous membrane. And I'm going to put a big bump on your nose so you can be aware of it. Every time you look in the mirror, you full of toxic debris. And I need some assistance in throwing this toxin off. If you would assist me, we can clean out up our house. But if you will not assist me, I will violently get it through. And it may be uncomfortable to you. That's what your subconscious is telling you if you listen to it. So if you had that bump, on your ovaries, or your kidney, or your liver, a little bump, it would be a liver cyst, it would be an ovarian cyst, it would be a kidney cyst. Now that's a serious situation. That ain't just a cosmetic problem, that is a what? Major problem. Because that little bump can cause major discomfort. But on your nose, hey, it just looks bad. So what is the difference between a bump on your ovaries versus a bump on your nose? Only difference is the location. That's it. That's the only difference because that bump on your nose is an abnormal growth. It is a cyst. It has kinship to tumor and cancer. Cancer is an abnormal growth. A bump is an abnormal growth. They have kinship. Now they may be first, second, or third cousins. So if they're if they are third cousin, they're benign. But if they're first cousin, they are no longer benign, they are what? Direct kinship to cancer. So a benign bump can become cancerous. And so now it is a major problem. So what we need to do is to let the body teach us how to remedy that problem. So when that bump gets on your nose, eventually it swells up a little bit, get a little white fluid inside of it, it bursts open, clean it out. A little bit is finished. To the next time. Okay? So if we can learn to cleanse, we can assist the body in throwing off these toxins. A fever is the body method of burning up waste. So fever is a friend and not an enemy to the body. It is trying to burn up the toxic filth in the system. The body naturally strives to keep itself cleansed and healthy. 
but we must learn to cooperate with the body. Basically, the process is the same, and just as it would be absurd to try to smother a sneeze, and it really would be. And, you know, as you look at this young man right here, he looked healthy. He looked really healthy. He's feeling good. So I'm going to put a little salt water up in his nose and a little golden seal up in his sinus cavity. And all of a sudden, Now he don't feel so good. And he's coughing, he's sneezing, and he feels bad. A moment earlier, he felt fine. Now my question to you, did the golden seal and the salt water give him a cold? No, it didn't. Well, what did the salt water and golden seal do? It produced a reaction in his body that manifests what was already happening inside of him. That cold was laying dormant in his system, waiting for the right environment, waiting for the right climatic changes, waiting for the, any reaction that would stimulate the immune system to make a violent effort to get rid of what was already there laying and hiding in the system. So that salt water was a foreign invader, that golden seal was a foreign invader coming into the system, and as it came in, your white blood cells immediately recognized, we have an invasion, let's get it out of here, and it make a violent force to get rid of the salt water, to get rid of the golden seal, and it cast it out, and anything else that was hiding, it went and found it, you get out of here too, and cast it out. And all of a sudden, it woke up that cold that was hiding, waiting for the proper time during winter time when the climate changed and it get chilly and as the atmosphere chills down your body chills and in order to protect you your body heat up a few degrees so you won't chill your muscles begin to shake you begin to tense up like that you know when you're cold why do you do that when you're cold why do you shake that's your muscles contracted <coughs> Why is your muscles contracting to burn calories? As it burns calories, anytime you burn something, you're going to have convulsion. The convulsion is going to produce heat. And so it's a self-generating process. You're doing that to what? Create heat. The cold weather do that. If it was hot, you wouldn't have to do that. You wouldn't have to do it. Hot, you want to take stuff off. Cold, you want to what? Close up and shake and try to heat yourself up. And as your body heat up, that old cold mucus that's hidden in the crooks and crannies of your body thin out. And then with a violent effort, you start sneezing and coughing and blowing your nose and, and all of that stuff. And you didn't even know it was that. I, many times I've taken an ice bucket of water in the summertime, and I've taken a person to cut his shirt off, and I would cast that bucket of water into his back. And the first thing they do is, <sighs> and the nose start running. Mm -hmm. oh, you take out the running up and down these hills, and you run and run, then you got to blow your nose. What doing that? You speed up your metabolism. As you speed up your metabolism, your body temperature increases. As your body temperature increases, you loosen up that old cold mucus. There it come out. Other exercise, I'm Same thing. Yeah. You speed up the metabolism. Now, if your metabolism is too slow, it's not going to heat up. And then that cold just stay dormant. Basically, the process is the same. And just as it would be absurd to try to smother sneeze, it would be ridiculous to try to stop nature in her process. So it is absurd to try to suppress the symptoms which constitute an outward and visible sign of the curing process that is going on in the body. It is totally against nature to try to stop symptoms. If a person has a big cancerous sore, 
that it's raining with all this stuff coming out of it, and it don't want to heal up. You shouldn't try to heal it up. It's absurd to try to heal up a cancerous soil that's resisting the healing process. You let it continue its process of cleansing. You aid it. You put whatever you can to draw it. You put a poultice on it to bring this necrotic fluid to the surface. You reduce the inflammation, but you try to get it out of the system. But to try to patch it up and cover it up will not help but cover up the problem, and that will not help. We must stop trying to put a covering over the problem. You know, it's kind of like Moses. Moses asked to see the visible presence of God, and God loved Moses because Moses was faithful. So what God told Moses, he said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put you in a cliff of a rock. He said, now Moses, I want you to understand one thing. That rock is Christ. He said, because a rock can't save you. He said, but I'm going to put you in a cliff of a rock. And he's going to shield, shield you from the direct presence of, of God, my Father. And the only way you're going to see me, you got to see me through, your, through my son. So my greatness, as it comes towards you, my son will shield you from being destroyed. So Moses did that. He put him in a cliff of a rock. And when he had passed by, he got a little glimpse of him. Moses was not aware that a, manifest a physical manifestation had taken place. Because he was standing in the presence of the brightness of God. He was all lit up and he didn't know it. Because if both are lit up, then there will be no visible changes. But the greater the darkness, the greater the light. And since both of them was lit up bright, they couldn't see a contrast. But when Moses came down from the presence of God, and he came in the camp of Israel with all that brightness, and they was in all that darkness, and the greater the darkness, the greater the light. And when they seen him, they said, whoa, he's a ghost. <laughs> they were scared to death of it. They thought Moses was, I don't know what they thought Moses was. His face was lit up like a lightning bulb. So Moses had a big problem. He could not teach the people the law of God because they were too busy looking at this bright light because they were afraid of it. And so finally, God knew that that light would be a hindrance for them understanding what he wanted them to know. So he told Moses to come back up here. He said, put a veil over that light. Because they could not see the greatness of God. Because all they could see is the weakness of themselves. And so, because the more greatness they saw of God, the more they want to hide. Because they felt unfit in his presence. So God said, put a veil on it. So, you know, cover that light up. He said, Moses, that veil is my son. I'm going to veil my divinity in humanity. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. He said, so when they see you, if you've seen my son, you've seen the father. That's what he was telling them. He said, show us the father. He said, if you've seen me, you've already seen him. God veiled his brightness in Christ through humanity. Now, they weren't afraid of humanity because of, uh, you know, I'm not afraid of another man. And Christ became another man in order that he may communicate the very characteristics of his father to them. He could talk to them face to face as a man. But he could not talk to them face to face as a God. Because they had too much stuff to hide. But if he, a man could understand their limitations, their liabilities, and so they could accept a man, even that man, Jesus Christ. So when Christ came, in that veil, by developing his divinity, that's the only way he could communicate. And he still had problems, even with that. And so we have to know that God want to remove that veil. We no longer need that veil today. We can go face to face with God. We can do it. So um, 
we should aid and abet them, not hinder and prevent them. Now, when I'm out giving lectures and talks to people, I'm about the gospel. I am not about being no, no doctor. You follow me? Okay. This is nothing but a trick. I only use the health to get the gospel to the people. Because health cannot save no one. It can bring you to where you can be saved. It is nothing but help in hand to bring you to the gospel. That's all it is. But if salvation is found in health, you don't need the gospel. But it's a beautiful tool. Matter of fact, it's the only tool that's effective today. And that is to bring the people to salvation. And that is the gospel. So you learn to put little, little things in the health. Stick it in there. <laughs> so bloomingly, you're teaching the gospel that they don't even know it. They don't even know it. And you can talk about dress reform. You can talk about diet reform. You can talk about worship reform. You can talk about all those things that's offensive and really get people mad. But they don't get mad when you're mingling with the health. I can talk about whatever I want to talk about as long as I mix it in health. But if I get up there and start talking about them short dresses and all that chicken you eat, they will throw me out of there. <laughs> But if I do it with the health, they say, amen, amen. <laughs> and I give them just a little bit, then I help them run away from that and get back to the health. Mm-hmm. What they get mad. <laughs> <laughs> we should aid and abet them, not hinder, not prevent them. Disease itself is the process of cure. This is the basic element of my teaching. Today we know this is correct. And every advance in natural hygiene has emphasized this truth more and more fully. But in Ellen White days, it was such a revolutionary idea that it met with violent opposition on all sides. And particularly, of course, by the orthodox medical profession, as indeed it does today. So they had problems with this concept with Ellen White. This is not my concept. I am not that smart. I simply stole it from Ellen White and the Pioneers. She taught that disease is a friend and not an enemy. All right? She taught that disease is a curative process. And all I did is come along many, many years later, and I'm teaching it, and they said, wow, man, that guy, they really got it, boy. They didn't know I stole it from them. I don't have, that's not mine. And I love the concept because it's the only one that works. So, uh, but she had problems with it. Now she continued. The impurities of the body, that's toxic waste, that's mucus, that's fecal matter, that's any stagnation of toxins in the system, if not allowed to escape, that's undigested protein, that is free radical. There are chemicals and additives and many other unnatural stabilizers. If it's not allowed to escape, if undigested protein that we ingest is not allowed to escape, it is taken back into the blood. It entered up into the lungs, and in the lungs it stimulates what we call bronchitis, asthma. If it end up in the sinus area, it stimulates what we call sinus, sinus problem. If it end up in the colon, we end up with Crohn's or colitis. If we end up under the mucous membrane or the skin, we end up with hives a uricle. If it end up in a thyroid problem, we end up with thyroid conditions such as hypo or hyperthyroid. These are symptoms of an undigested protein in a section in the body where there's no mechanism to break down that protein. That makes that protein an offensive protein. Offensive because it should not be there. So now um, I can deal with the symptoms. I can suppress the symptoms. I can relieve the congestion. 
But did I really cure the problem? No, because I'm addressing the symptoms. But if I focus on what was the problem, the problem was an undigested protein being somewhere where there's no mechanism to break down protein to amino acid. If I can get that protein to the gastric digestion system, where it has a system to break down protein, then I have cured the problem. But if I'm going to deal with the symptoms, I'm only trying to stop the very thing that's trying to make me aware that I got a problem. Nature to relieve herself of the poisonous impurities, make an effort to free the system. Now, nature is your body. Your body will attempt to free the system. And in its attempt to do it, it produces what we call disease. It is not disease, but that's what we call it. This effort produced fever. And what is termed, in other words, which is called disease, not really disease, because a fever is not a disease. A fever is a curative reaction. It's a friend. But even then, if those who are afflicted would assist nature in her effort by the use of pure soft water, much suffering would be prevented. But many, instead of doing this and seeking to remove the poisonous matter from the system, they take a more deadly poison into the system to remove a poison already there. So now when they get sick, or they perceive they're sick because they see all these symptoms, and all these symptoms making them feel bad, they say, well, look, I've got to feel better. And so they try some concoction that would make them feel better. So they take poison to try to cure poison. That's homeopathy. That's what that, that's homeopathy. In other words, that means that is also allopathic medicine. That is like kind cures like kind. That's homeopathy. Or it's simply the caduceus. You know what the caduceus is? That's that snake wrapped around that dead tree. Now what in the world a snake Whirl up around a dead tree and have to do with getting healed. The tree is dead, and the snake represents dead, death. And he got his mouth full biting a dead tree, saying that like kind cures like kind. So poison cures poison. And so, but that's not how God operates. God said that serpent head should be smashed. But in the medical system, they said life comes through the serpent. He's going to bite a dead tree and bring life back into the tree by injecting poison into a dead tree. And then we look at that and we don't know. Okay, it's just a, a logo. It ain't nothing to it. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're injecting poisonous, toxic chemicals in your system to try to heal what you think has brought about some sickness in the system. And then now when they put that poison in, you know, it really made me feel better. I feel better, you know. They don't understand that the body will act on the strongest toxin to get rid of it. And the strongest toxin is not those aches and pain. It is that allopathic medicine they put in. Your body will act on those medicines to get it out. And once you get it out, it's an easy thing to take out the other little problem that's causing it at the same time. So your body acts on the drugs, rid your body of that, and you feel better. But if you had just went through a purge, a fast, a cleansing, a detox, you would have felt better without taking the drug. But we don't we don't look like we don't look at things like that. Nature will bear as long as she can without resistance. Then she would arouse and make a mighty effort to rid herself of the encumbrance and evil treatment she has suffered. So what nature is trying to do now is to try to figure out how to get rid of this problem. But now that she's figuring it out, she said, I'm going to bring a headache on. Maybe i bring a little chilling of the body on. Now I tell you what, I'm going to try a fever this time. 
Uh, nervousness. It's not bringing that on. So that comes on after the disease has already been established. That is the reaction to let you know that you have a disease. A wrong course of eating destroys, uh, eating or drinking destroys health with its sweetness of life. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What is the disease? And I answer, it is the wrong course of eating and drinking. That is the disease. The disease is not arthritis. It is not cancer. That is a reaction to the disease that has already been developed. So not by smothering the symptoms, but by removing the cause of these symptoms, when they themselves would naturally and automatically disappear. So in other words, if we didn't do nothing, we didn't do anything. Just don't even worry about it. Don't do nothing. If you didn't treat a cold, just let it run its course. Most people would get well in a few days. It will make you feel bad for a few days, and then it's gone. But we don't want to feel bad for a few days. So we take a drug, we take antihistamines, which is counterproductive. Antihistamines drive the mucus, stop you from sneezing and coughing. And the body is trying to produce a histamine reaction. A histamine reaction makes you sneeze. It makes you cough. It makes you get rid of it. Antihistamines stop that process. Today, this condition is known among, known among health reformers as toxemia. That's waste in the system. By this, they do not mean germs or the excretion of germs, but a general condition of poisoning brought on by excessive of putrefying waste material in the bloodstream and the body in general. When this is expelled, when all these toxins are expelled out of the system, all symptoms, that is, all so-called diseases spontaneously vanish. The patient is cured. The true art of healing is thus very simple. All the so-called diseases are basically one. So we do not have hundreds, thousands of diseases. We only have one disease. And since we only have but one disease, we only have but one cure. And so that means we do not have to spend months and years learning all of these diseases. All we need to do is spend a few days learning about one disease and one cure. That would be so simple, wouldn't it? Now let's look at it from a spiritual perspective. How many sins do we have? One. That's right. And that's the transgression that Adam committed. Now he said, well, wait a minute. I'm sinning. Now you got symptoms of that one sin Adam committed. All the stuff we're doing are symptoms of that one sin. Do y'all understand that? Because <laughs> if Adam had committed that one sin, we wouldn't even be doing what we're doing. Even though I am doing a lot worse than Adam did, but it was because of Adam one sin that I produced the symptoms of lying. And still in a killing. If Adam had not committed that, I would not have the symptoms, and consequently, I would not be killing and lying and stealing and doing all of that. So now, when God died, He died to what? Redeem Adam from that one fall. And by redeeming Adam, He said, "I'm no respected person." And God, and Adam said, "God, what about all my children?" I'm talking about the second Adam. He said, "What about all my children?" And He said, "The blood that I." applied to your one sin has covered them also. Ain't that something? How you do that? So God ain't concerned about us. He's concerned about Adam. 
If he can fix Adam, he got us fixed. All we need to do is obey our daddy. That's all. If we obey our daddy, then our daddy get us saved. But the problem is we hard-headed and we don't want to obey our daddy. So what was the one remedy that God used to cure the one sin? It's the blood of his son. So the life of the flesh is in the blood. So that means if there's one sin and the one cure is the blood of Christ, then if there's one disease, then the one solution is the blood of plants. And the blood of plants, there's a solution called chlorophyll. The chlorophyll is identical to the human blood in composition, like an only iron. And so God has given us the chlorophyll for the healing of the nations. God gave us vegetables to extend our probation. And so we was no longer compatible for a translation diet we now need a reformed diet to bring us back to the translation diet. And that reformed diet is fruits, grains, nuts, and vegetables. That is to reform us back to the original diet. God did not give Adam a reformed diet. God gave Adam a perfect diet. It was compatible to a perfect man. But we are no longer perfect. Now we need to regain per perfection through the work of the atonement and that will be a lifetime of obedience. That's why God brings us to justification. Now why do we come to justification? So we can be justified to live. Because we're now, we're in reality, we are justified to die. Do we understand that? But through Christ and his merits, and we accept him, we are justified to live. He justifies us. Do justification then make me holy? No. God forbid but it also don't make me guilty either. That's the beauty of it. I'm not holy, not sinful. Justification just gives me a time period to do it right again the second time. As I go about that second time to do it right, that is my sanctification. In other words, it is my daily overcoming my besetting problems. Why should I need that sanctification? It proves my appreciation of the atonement that Christ made. At the end of my test period, then I can glorify God. Those three steps into the kingdom. And so that one solution for disease, blood of plants. That one solution for my spiritual life is the blood of Christ. It is about the blood and the blood only. And Christ have made it so plain and so simple for us to work with disease. But we want to depend on pills, tonics, and all kinds of stuff. And we're giving credit to those things when those things can never in themselves cure us of anything. It is our faith that makes us the whole. The same work is at work. Or the same cause is at work. And the same method of treatment is applicable in particular, in particular, all cases. All morbid actions are evidence of the remedial effort of nature to overcome the morbid condition or to expel the morbid, morbid material. All that any true system of medication can do or should attempt to do is to place the organism under the best possible circumstance for the favorable operation of those efforts. We can draw interrupt, suppress them, and stop the action of the body's process. But we must confess to this paradoxical proposition of the disease are the evidence of the restorative effort. The effort, however, may be unequal to the end in view, and hence the power of nature are to be assisted in removing the obstacles Diverting the irritation, this morbid material has been accumulating within the system as results mainly of our dietetic transgression. So it's been building up and building up through our years, through our lifetime. And now he has come to an end. 
Now we're going to look at the effects of our dietary transgression. In a healthy person, a low blood pressure is a sign of good health, as long as the systolic pressure is above 80. Very low pressure in a person with heart disease may be a sign of heart failure. Now you begin to recognize the results of our dietary transgression. <clears throat> so if that pressure is too low, consistently that person may have congested heart failure. One type of low blood pressure that could predict future heart problems is called uh, hypotension. This type of low blood pressure, that is a drop of 10 to 20 points of blood pressure when a person moves from one sitting to, uh, or to land flat position to a standing position. So if you lay down or you set up lay down into a standing position, if your pressure dropped between 10 and 20 points and it caused a sudden sense of lightheadedness, it could be due to, heart, to a heart condition. And so I always do that. When I work with a person and I do an assessment, I have them to lay flat. <clears throat> I have them to set up and I have them to lay back down, I have them to lay flat and raise up real quick. And if, if they start feeling moves in the head, then I know I'm dealing with a cardiovascular problem, I'm dealing with a circuitry problem. Either that blood is too low, or there's some congestion, congestion somewhere. And I know that's a serious problem. A good, another good rule is to have the doctor to check your blood pressure with both arms. Check your right and your left arm. Then measure the difference between the two. They found that a blood pressure difference of 10 to 15 points between arms increases the risk of dying from a stroke or from heart disease. How many doctors check both arms? They don't waste no time with that. Now, they just want to get that pressure and get you out of there and put you on some medicine. You're going to take some medicine. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that being a dad. It's no problem. Either way, you're going to take medicine. Just take the medicine. That's what they tell you to do. But you got to be proactive enough to start doing it yourself and stop depending on them. Having a difference of 15 points or more was found to double the risk of, of perinic artery disease a condition that affects more than 12 million Americans. A straw color to transparent color, a yellow pea, this is the normal uh, urine color of a healthy, well hydrated person. This is what it should look like, transparent, a clear pea. You should always be properly hydrated but you can actually drink too much water, which will make your urine colorless. If your pee is crystal clear, you probably drink in too much water, which can throw off some of your electric lights. All right? If your urine is clear and you pee 20 times a day, you're drinking too much water. All right? What does the color of your urine indicate? Ideally, your urine should be a pale yellow color. This would indicate you are well hydrated. For example, dark brown urine may indicate liver problem. It may also reflect there's some blood or redness in the urine. It can be potential, potential problems with your kidneys. Factors that can cause urine 
Urinary blood includes urinary tract infection, enlarged prostate, cancerous and non-cancerous tumors, kidneys, and, uh, and also too much exercise, kidney stone, bladder stone. Some foods can also do that, such as beets and blackberries and so on. Most people urinate between six to eight times a day. But if you're drinking plenty of water, it is not abnormal to go as many as 10 times a day. And that's okay. So let's look and see um, what color our urine should be. So the um, transparent yellow color at the top right up there should be the normal urine. That dark yellow, uh, but it need, you need to drink, you know, you can't on the borderline, you need to drink more water soon. Dark brown, you're severely dehydrated. You're putting stress on the liver. Pink and red, investigate possibly some things that you're eating. Also, it could be some infection in the bladder or prostate. If it's crystal clear, you're probably drinking too much water. If it's pale yellow, it's a good healthy urine. So you can see that <clears throat> by knowing these little things can help you understand what's going on in your body. And you, you would get these indications way ahead of a problem. See, before you end up with bladder cancer, it's going to be telling you that, hey, you know, um, your urine got a little pink, reddish color to it. And, you know, you need to probably increase your water consumption. You may need to change your diet. And all same thing with, with your poop. You know, you need to know what is a healthy poop and what is an unhealthy poop. And so by understanding that, it can help you a lot. It is important to know what diverticulitis is because determine, determining that will lead to appropriate treatment. More important, if you know what caused it, then you can take steps to prevent it. Diverticulitis is inflammation or infection of the small pouches called diverticulitis, which develop along the wall of the intestines. The formation of these pouches themselves is relative benign condition, but they can become infected and they can develop diverticulitis. Arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. When you shake a person's hand, they say, oh, hey, how you doing? You shake the hand. You, all you do is shake the hand. I don't do that. I'm going to do it in slow motion for you. I say, hey, how you doing? I just checked their hand out. And they didn't know it because I do it like that. And you didn't get it. But in actual slow motion, I'm going like this. And I check the joints in the hand. And I don't say anything, but now if I get with them later, they say, you know, you got a little arthritis going on. I said, don't you bend down, don't touch nothing. They bend down and they say, click, click, click. And I said, okay, I got it. <laughs> they didn't get it. But I'm hearing those sounds, you know. When they walk by me, I can click, 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 click. I said, I got it. Because I'm paying attention to it. They're not paying attention to that. They got used to them clicking and clacking in their body. But I am focusing on it, listening to it, all the sounds and everything where they're coming from. Yes. Is it the joints what you hear? Because sometimes I hear it in my office, co-workers yeah. talking about it, and I hear the sound. I recognize already the person without seeing who's coming. I know it by the sound. So this is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is this a sign then of a virus? It's a sign of a calcium. Uh, the calcium's, uh, calcification is trying to set in. The bone should be flexible. It should be making noise like that. But if the collagen is beginning to dry out between the joints, 
then you, it's kind of like having two metal parts that don't have any oil, a lubricant, and it's producing friction. Eventually, it's going to wear the collagen off the bone, and it's going to be bone against bone. But right now, it's just making noise. But as they grow older, pick up a little extra weight, it's going to rub off that collagen and bone against bone. Then they're going to need knee replacement or hip replacement. So what's the treatment for that? Okay, good. I'm guessing you said Okay. okay, I'm going to give you a good treatment. <laughs> okay. Take a chicken egg mm -hmm. and put it in that Coke, that bottle right there mm -hmm. without breaking it. Put it in a Coke bottle, that bottle right there, without breaking a chicken egg. If you can put a chicken egg in that bottle without breaking it, then you can figure out how to cure arthritis. They do it in the, they do it in the circus all the time. You know, they have these eggs up there. And they said, if you can put that egg in there, you get $25, you get $10. And you try to do it, and he'll say, let me show you. He'll put that egg on the top of that ball, and it hit it, and it dropped right in the ball. Mm -hmm. He said, how do you do that? He said, now you do it. You put it up there, and you hit it, and burst the egg. You just lost you $10 or $20. <laughs> but what they do is, he got some special eggs that he soaked those eggs in vinegar. He soak them in vinegar. And what it is, it, uh, it has a bond, what's called a bond. I didn't know chemistry enough what a bond is. And I'll just show you what I'm talking about. A bond is like little arms that connects. Those are bonds, right there, okay? A bonds. So now, what takes place is, when they connect it like that, they make a solid mass. And they hard. So, but now, if you can break those bonds, you set, you set them free. And now it's more rubbery. But when they put together, it's hard, because it's phosphorus. Phosphorus holding these protein bonds together. Phosphorus is like cement that's holding this protein. If you can remove the phosphorus, then it's not hard anymore. So what vinegar do, vinegar breaks the bond that hold these proteins together. And now it's rubbery. That shell becomes rubbery and soft. And so you can put it on there and squeeze it right in the bottle. And when it get in there, it's set there, and then it will regrow those bonds back and get hard like a, a chicken egg. It's just a trick. <laughs> okay? So now, if that vinegar can dissolve those protein bonds, those phosphorus and protein bonds that is holding things together, like a cement, you have a brick house, it is the mortar that holds those bricks together. If you could dissolve the mortar from holding those bricks, what would happen to those bricks? They fall off the house. So by dissolving those bonds, those bonds represent the cement that's holding that protein together. The vinegar breaks those bonds. So that now it's flexible and the egg can go right into the bottle with no problem. So what can we learn from that? Tell me what we can learn from that. If you've got arthritis, you got too much protein. Uh, too much calcification and protein that's in your joints. Mm -hmm. The vinegar can dissolve that calcification that's in the joints of this person's hand. See those knuckles right there? Mm -hmm. That's calcification. Mm -hmm. That is protein, phosphorus, and calcium that have made cement, like little lumps and knots on his fingers. The vinegar will break the bond down, mm -hmm. soften that up, so that now it can be dissipated and removed out of the system. So you would drink vinegar? Like you could drink, I don't advocate so drinking a lot of vinegar, but you soak it. You soak your hand in hot vinegar. And you soak it in vinegar one night, you soak it in castor oil the next night. And what it would do, it would break the bond of that protein and phosphorus and calcium that have made cement and made lumps that we call calcification. 
it would break it up and soften it. So then now you can move the joints and the joints are not so painful. So, for example, when you kneel down, sometimes you hear this. Hmm. This is the same thing? It's the same thing. That's, that's where the collagen has been dry, dry too dry. And uh, eventually you're going to wear it off and you're going to have bone against bone. So in this case, you, you would put um, like something on your knee, or you can drink also something. You can drink a little, a little, little. Kind of, uh, but I would put uh, a vinegar poultice, yeah. a pack on it. Mm -hmm. If it's in the toes of the feet, I would do a, a foot, a hand soak. I would do that, and then I would alternate from a castor oil to a vinegar pack. And the then, big problem with castor oil, most people don't know how to do castor oil packs right. It's a certain way you had to do it and uh, to get the real effect of it. You can't use something real thin, like you would use something, most people want to use something this thick. They want that. This would be considered thick to them. But with me, I like to use something about that thick for my castor oil packs. And I want to soak that in hot castor oil, wring it out a little bit, and then I want to apply that over and wrap that real good. Then you you really see the effects of castor oil when you do that. Okay. And let's look at them. Yes. And you need to change the nutrition also to get rid of that problem. Yeah, because you need to eat less protein or what? Right, because see, there's calcium right there. Go back up. Here. So now you've got that knee joint mm -hmm. right there. Now, uh, you've got the calcium deposits in that knee. Yes. That calcium deposits come from calcium, phosphorus, and protein all mixed together. It makes cement. And it get hard. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's come because we're consuming the wrong type of calcium. Mm -hmm. We're taking calcium from cow's milk uh, and other sources. What you really need is sodium calcium. That is the calcium from plants mm -hmm. and vegetables. Cows, animals do not have arthritis like we do, especially the ones that are strictly plant-based. The only ones that really have problems are dogs and cats that eat other animals. They can have arthritis, but you hardly ever see a horse or a cow with arthritis. Mm -hmm. And it's because he depends on his calcium from the grass and the vegetation. That's what we call sodium calcium. The sodium calcium keeps the calcium from solidifying and becoming hard. So when this calcium builds up in here, it's like little calcium spurs that develop. You got to go in and dissolve those calcium. So what you want to do is to put on a thick castor oil or vinegar pack over that. And you want to wrap that, soak it in a nice cloth, then put some type of plastic wrap, wrap over it to contain it. And leave that on there and that will dissolve these calcium spurs or calcium deposits that may be in the joints. Let's look at another one. Now, once again, all this is from our dietary trans transgression. Now, here's one but this person have these big blisters. Once again, I go back to my illustration. He got the, well, he don't have big blisters. He's got arthritic knee. So he's got an arthritic knee. And it's real inflamed. So what we want to do now is take, and once you get that, once you get that, you got a lot of fluid on that knee. Right, just like this, let me explain. Can I just look exactly? Okay, so that knee got a lot of fluid on it. You want to get that fluid off of that knee. Because the reason that fluid is on that knee is to contain the inflammation. 
That inflammation want to go up here. That inflammation want to go down here. It want to get into the circulatory system. You got the, what your body would naturally try to do is to contain that fluid. I mean, contain that inflammation by producing fluid where the inflammation is. Now, the reason we know that is that doctors give you a drug called prednisone for people to have pain. But prednisone make you look like you're gaining weight because it contains the fluids. And the prednisone will keep the fluid in the area where the inflammation at to keep the inflammation from spreading. Your body makes its own natural prednisone to contain the fluids so that the fluid won't move up here, it won't move down there, it'll stay right here. Do we understand that? Mm -hmm. So now, what we want to do now is to get this fluid off. So you come along to get that fluid off the knee and you put a garlic poultice. You put a garlic poultice on the knee. All right? And that's where you take a whole garlic bud, you chop it up, you put it in the blender, you put just enough water to make a thick paste out of it, and you lay that on top of the kneecap. Please do not put it on the back. Don't put it on the back, on the side. Put it on the top of the kneecap. Do you put it directly on the skin or have you something between? No, directly on the skin. Okay. Now, when you put it directly on the skin, well, it's very sharp. It's, it's like burning, you know? It's going to burn. <laughs> it's going to give you a third degree burn. That's what you see right there. That's what you see. And then these blisters, a big blister is going to come up. These big blisters will come up on the knee. That garlic is going to give like a third degree burn. Remember now, all this inflammation and fluid is here. Now, all of a sudden, this fluid is coming up into those blisters. And it's bringing inflammation with it. Mm -hmm. Then you take a sterilized needle mm -hmm. and you prick those blisters. And the fluid drains out. You draw the fluid out. Okay? So when you draw that fluid out, you're pulling out the inflammation because inflammation is in the fluids. How do we know this? We know that you can go to a doctor and he said, I'm going to have to draw this fluid off your knee. And he come out with this big old needle and he going to stick that in your knee and he pull the fluid off. All right? You don't have to do that. The garlic will do it. It will pull it off. This is a very painful treatment. It is painful. For about six hours, it is really painful. That garlic will burn you. But when you finish this process, you'll be able to walk. You will not need a knee replacement. Okay? Let's stop right there. We're going to take a break, about a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and finish this up.